the adoption by these people of your innovation, then they can actually lead to rapid um, adoption by the early majority and eventually the late majority. So when we're looking at diffusion, we're not just looking at um, how many units you've sold of a particular product. We're also looking at who you've sold them to. Because who you've sold them to and how you can shape those, um, that, those consumption uh, patterns is really important for strategy. So one way that diffusion of a product or a service or an innovation um, occurs is through your targeting of certain groups. But the degree and the speed of diffusion of an innovation is also shaped by features of that innovation. Okay, here's an example. Virtual reality. Yeah, we all know about virtual reality, yeah. Um, virtual reality has been around probably 20, 30 years. It seemed to offer huge potential, just like expert systems, which I did at university in the 1980s, just like artificial intelligence. Um, these are very, very promising technologies, but what's interesting about virtual reality is that although it's a very promising, sophisticated technology, it has really struggled to be adopted and diffused in the marketplace. And the question is, why is that? If, it's so, if, it's, if it offers so much potential, why has it struggled to be adopted and diffused? And part of the reason, for example, in virtual reality, um, is because it's difficult to demonstrate its benefits. It's difficult to trial um, virtual reality. And one of the reasons, if, if you look at, say, the Sony Walkman, one of the reasons why it diffused so quickly is that Sony were able to show by getting the shirts with the big pocket, which you could put your Sony Walkman in, they could very quickly trial and demonstrate the benefit of that product. If you saw someone with a shirt, we had the, with the, with the, port, uh, the uh, Walkman in there, compared to the big, the big um, radios and tape recorders we were talking about before, the ghetto bastards, you can see the, the difference in, in the advantages straight away. So there are a number of factors about the, inf the characteristics of an innovation that can shape the speed by which it is diffused and adopted. So how does the, does the new innovation show a great deal of advantage over and above existing um, possibilities? Or is it just simply a new innovation that does pretty much the same performance? Is it possible to easily show the benefits of using that new technology compared to existing um, possibilities? These are sorts of questions that can um, shape the kind of ways in which companies try to market new innovations. Uh, because if the ability to trial um, a new innovation and to show the benefits influence the speed by which it diffuses, then that is something that marketing needs to think about in relation to how they uh, develop the marketing uh, strategy. I think we'll finish in a couple of seconds, then we can move to questions. I'm not going to go into any of the details here, but what I've tried to do with the table towards the end is look at the five different models and show what those models mean in relation to the early stage, the um, mature stage, and the decline stage of a technology. And these models say different things about the, the technology. And they also gi are giving strong signals about what the strategy should be for that organization in that sector. So we've talked about the shift from product to process innovation. We've talked about the emergence of dominant design. We've talked about the ways in which you might be able to shape the diffusion of an innovation. So all of these models, these dynamic models, are really important for thinking about how we set strategy to, um, to benefit from the innovations that we might produce.
So although these patterns that I've shown you are quite typical in many sectors, they are not deterministic. They are all shaped by organizational's behavior. And if they are behavior, that shape, if you can shape those, um, those curves by your behavior, then those behaviors should be part of your strategy. So what I wanted to reveal by talking about these models is the way in which companies can adapt their strategy to shape the diffusion, the direction of technologies. Okay, I'll stop now because um, there's quite a lot of material there um, and open up for any questions. Like, what was he talking about? <laughs> Do any of those models suggest they may be useful for you in thinking about strategy? Yeah. Um, do any, do you, I mean, how many people work in services here or, or the, the public sector? Yeah. Do many of you see potential there or do you just simply see these are about products? You can see potential, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if there's no questions or... Not, not a question, just yeah. um, something that came yeah. to mind on the diffusion model. Yeah. And I'm sitting there and thinking, like, I've seen a few products launched at times and people lining up outside stores at 4 a.m. to purchase and they wonder why. Mm -hmm. Again, it's all the hype that's built around. Mm -hmm. I imagine well, they fall into the early adopters, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I've... <laughs> Last week, in England, they launched the iPad, and there were people queued down the streets. But I suspect they were probably what we would call innovators on that list, because the majority of us probably at this moment probably don't actually think there's a great deal more advantage in having a computer that looks a bit like an, um, an iPhone, but just bigger. Um, I think we're still a, a way away from early adopters adopting this technology. I think what will happen is people will see how it uh, how it evolves, actually. Um, what we seem to forget is there has been a number of launches by Apple and other companies of similar technologies. I mean, it's present, this, this, I mean it's, it is interesting in terms of the software because it looks a bit like the iPhone. It's very, very clever the way you can touch it and open it. There. But essentially, the iPad as a kind of technology of like a notepad is not new at all. It's been around probably 10 or 15 years. And a number of companies have tried to bring out products that have failed for whatever reason. And it, so quite often the reason has been around some of these issues here. Quite often, a new product doesn't actually have much greater benefit than existing technologies. I mean, has the iPad really got um, a great deal of greater advantage and benefit over a portable? I don't know. And it's not whether it does, it's whether our perceptions are that it does. Um, and if our perceptions are that it doesn't, then, then the iPad's going to fail. Yeah. So a, a, key, a key aspect of um, the diffusion model is, is looking at whether, you know, if you evaluate the technology in those kind of dimensions, does the iPad have a relative advantage over an existing product? Possibly not. Um, can its benefits be observed? Well, it's actually quite a, a simple product to demonstrate, actually, which is why it will potentially have quick sales, but it may tail off if people find there's no real advantage. Um, but yes, good example. I mean, the late majority so they have a long way to go before. It's interesting. Um, the late majority can really hold up a technology. For example, um, if one thinks about digital technology, uh, digital television, in, in um, Australia, uh, I believe they've delayed the switch off of the analog television um, again and again and again because the late majority are basically refusing to buy new televisions. And, if you d and because they say, well, why should I? I've got a, a perfectly working television. <laughs> so um, that late majority can have some interesting impacts on the diffusion and the removal of the old. Um, so these, these groups are quite interesting to look at because they can 
Um, they're, very, they, they're purchasing habits are very different and the way that you market to an innovator is very different than you, you market to an early adopter or a late adopter or the early or, or late majority. So it has very important implications for marketing yeah, and the signals that you send through marketing. Uh, how, how, have, um, how have the models in this area sort of accommodated, I'm um, thinking of innovations within innovations, mm. thinking of the whole area of, uh, for instance, yeah. software as a service. Yeah. on some of the um, traditional software um, companies that, that actually produce applications on, on CDs and mm. every you know, year you send it in mm. to the clients to, to upgrade. Now that's not, not needed anymore with SaaS applications. It's mm. overnight. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't buy discs from Microsoft exactly. anymore. You download, don't you? Um, I suppose it's adopted a bit, it, it's, it's represented by the reverse product process cycle. What the reverse product process cycle is saying that process innovations now are driving the service sector. So technological processes are allowing all sorts of service innovations to emerge, whether it's in the delivery of software, whether it's in the um, uh, development of software, or whether it's in um, delivery of financial services. So. The, the pro reverse product cycle, reverse product process cycle is probably quite a useful model for understanding what's going on there because it's basically saying, unlike with physical products where product comes before process innovation, it's the other way around. And the, what that's basically saying to companies is if you really want to develop innovative services, you've got to do that off the back of innovative process. Yeah, and that innovative... If you look at some of the really interesting service innovations, they're coming off the back of the internet, they're coming off the back of, well, the internet is, is probably the prime example of all sorts of different, um, not just companies like Amazon, but things like rent a crowd. You can, <laughs> if you want to rent a crowd, literally, um, for, for something, you can. I mean, the, 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 the innovations that are coming off the back of the internet are just phenomenal. Um, and, so, and that's just a perfect example of showing how process leads product in the service sector rather than the other way around in, in, the, in the sort of tangible product sectors. Yep. Uh, one comment. I see in the software developing companies uh, 20 years ago, this, the company was to focus in, in innovating. Now the software company is trying to do use CMA. <coughs> Or for different process improvement to lower the cost. Do you think now this, the software company now is, is trying to another life cycle from the product? So, companies shifting to using the ISO? Yeah, now, yeah. And now it's starting to focus mm. in ISO now down to mm. the CMMA or another methodology. If I, if I can use an analogy there, um, one of the things we'll talk about on Saturday is that there are certain organizational structures and cultures that are good for innovation and certain that are good for um, quality. And um, uh, quality actually requires bureaucracy. It requires you to be organized in a way that restricts creativity because you want people to do the same every single time. So actually, uh, what a very bureaucratic structure, which would include ISO standards, to limit variation is very good for producing quality products at low cost. But it's not very good for innovation. Um, innovation uh, tends to occur much better in companies that have what you call a more organic structure, i.e. less bureaucracy, less hierarchy, um, less restriction on what you do. Um, what, if a company tries to remain 